and a very special welcome to this virtual event, Advancing Women, Peace and Security in the Pacific Islands region. I'm Alain Verveer and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And we are absolutely delighted to be co-hosting this discussion with the Embassy of Australia uh, in the United States. In 2017, the Institute launched the first ever index on women, peace and security. It constitutes the most comprehensive ranking to date of women's well-being around the world. We know that the condition of women and the conditions of nations go hand in hand and that countries are far more peaceful and prosperous when women are accorded full and equal rights and opportunities. The index goes beyond the dimension of inclusion, which covers education, political participation, economic participation, all very important, but also adds factors of justice, discriminatory practices, for example, and security. Are women safe in their homes? Are they safe in their communities? Thereby using the three dimensions, providing a much more comprehensive understanding of the condition of women. We rank 167 countries and the countries that rank lowest are usually unstable or in fact mired in conflict. At the end of this year, we will release the global index the 2021 Global Index, which has become a staple for government leaders, for policymakers, and advocates around the world. In today's discussion, we will focus on the Pacific Islands region, where women play critical roles at both the policy and grassroots levels in peace building, the economy, climate action, and so much more. But the index shows, however, that critical gaps remain in addressing violence against women and women's representation in government. We will hear from distinguished experts, each of whom has worked to advance women's inclusion, access to justice and security across the Pacific Islands region, including uh, and especially today, in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, from which two of our expert participants hail. We are being joined for this conversation by more than 500 attendees, and we're so pleased to have a large number from Australia and from, from the Pacific Islands. We have already received many pre-submitted questions from audience members, but you will also have an opportunity to submit questions during the course of this discussion. If you wish to do so, please use the Q&A feature on your screen and note your name, your affiliation, and to whom you are directing your question. And now we will begin by hearing from Her Excellency, Julianne Guevara, Australia's Ambassador for Gender Equality. She is a distinguished member of the diplomatic corps, having served as ambassador to Spain, Andorra, and Equatorial Guinea. She is Australia's first female indigenous ambassador. Earlier, she served as her country's lead services negotiator for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership when she was assistant secretary of Southeast Asia Investment Branch. She's a champion for, her, for the rights of women and girls around the world with a very special focus on the Pacific. Ambassador, we're so thrilled to have you with us for this program. And we all look forward to hearing from you, uh, setting a context for us for this discussion. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Vivia. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to join you this evening for this panel discussion on advancing women, peace and security in the Pacific. I'd like to begin obviously by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking to you from today here in Canberra and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. 
I'd really like to uh, thank Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for this opportunity, obviously, to talk about the WPS agenda and how it applies to our region, to the Pacific. Um, I thought I would sort of um, cast my, my um, presentation in, in with four key areas. What's happening on the WPS agenda, uh, you know, since it started, what's happened with COVID in our region, in the Pacific region, what are we doing about that right now, and a little bit about what's happening um, in Australia. Uh, I, like you, Ambassador Bavia, are absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to hear from real experts in the region, as well um, the colleagues who are on the panel, who obviously will be sharing sort of quite varied perspectives about how they see it from, from various parts of the Pacific, because it's a very, uh, the blue continent is a very large one, so <laughs> the impacts, uh, you know, are quite varied across the region. Um, of course, last year was the 20th anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution uh, 1325, which established the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And the four pillars which were developed of participation, prevention, protection, relief and recovery have obviously informed um, our work over that time. I'd have to say on the normative side, you know, we have seen the UN Security Council continue its work in developing resolutions that really have, I think, tried to add sort of meat to the bones of this agenda. Um, and we have made many advances along the way. But I think what we can see, and this was evident in the UN Secretary General's report uh, last year was, we still have some way to go. Um, some of the key uh, statistics that really stood out for me was obviously between 1992, which was just before this agenda was established, and 2019, women made up only 13% of negotiators. We had 6% of them as mediators. We have only 6% of them as signatories of peace agreements. The percentage of peace agreements which have gender equality provisions obviously have increased from around 14 to 22% in a similar sort of time frame. Unfortunately, what we're still seeing is women human rights defenders, journalists, trade unionists killed in conflict affected countries. And I think that's been a phenomenon that we have continued to see, particularly during the COVID-19 period. Um, when we look at women's effective and meaningful participation in decision making, we can't um, ignore the statistics still on women's representation in parliaments, where of course only one in four women uh, are a member of a national parliament. This, however, is a slight increase. It, um, you know, it has doubled since the, the WPS agenda was first started back in, in, in 1995. So it's gone from 12% to around about 24, 25% at this point in time. Systemically, of course, a number of countries have developed national action plans on women, peace and security. I think we now have around 85 member states that have act national action plans. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, again, if you look at our region in particular, that, that number is still quite low. In the Indo-Pacific region, I think we have, however, seen an increased focus on the WPS agenda as a framework for addressing the drivers of conflict and instability, as well as new and emerging threats. If I take, for example, in Southeast Asia, we've seen the ASEAN community develop their first ever statement on women, peace and security back in 2017. And then in the Pacific, you know, we've seen, of course, um, the PIF leaders, so the Pacific Island Forum leaders agree the Boe Declaration on Regional Security back in 2018. And I think this was significant because it's really established a, a framework for, you know, an expanded concept of security, uh, which is about in, uh, inclusive of human security, humanitarian assistance, prioritizing environmental security and regional cooperation to build resilience against natural disasters, which we obviously have seen had quite a significant impact on, on many communities across um, you know, the Pacific. Under the Bowie Declaration, there are discussions on the WPS agenda, which are mandated as part of the, defense, the South Pacific Defense Minister's uh, meeting um, processes. So over the last few years, I mean, Australia obviously has worked too with um, key civil society organisations to advance key parts of this um, WPS agenda. 
Speaking of those, those issues around political participation, I just wanted to give one example. Um, we have provided support uh, to the office uh, of the Bougainville Electoral Commissioner under the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, the She Leads project, which um, has been providing uh, women's leadership training to continue capacity building to community uh, women's leaders to be part of the She Leads alumni. Some of those leaders obviously were able to use their skills uh, when engaged to raise awareness about elections um, and including um, some of the findings of the violence against women in elections assessment done in Bougainville back in, um, I think that was 2018, 2019. Obviously there is still much work to be done um, in PNG, of course, unfortunately we don't have any uh, women's representation in parliament at this point in time. But as Fiona, who is on the line, and I think um, Dr. Hukala, who will speak later, will obviously share a little bit about, you know, what is being um, done in PNG to try and address this. Um, uh, so, of course, systematically, while things have been ticking along, um, suddenly we are arguably confronted with the most sig significant challenge to human development um, since um, COVID-19 pandemic hit which has meant we've needed to respond to sort of growing health, social and economic challenges in our region. While the Pacific region may have not had the number of cases of COVID-19 comparable to other regions, although I, we have seen a recent lockdown in Fiji um, and, and PNG has been uh, affected um, more recently as well. It cannot be said that those broader effects, however, have not been felt. Indeed, the impacts in terms of social health and, and the economies of the region have been quite significant. Um, on the end, uh, gendered impacts in particular of COVID-19, the Pacific has unfortunately experienced similar issues to other parts of the world. We've seen spikes in gender-based violence in a region where the prevalence is already twice as high as the global average. Sectors, of course, which traditionally employ women, such as the hospitality uh, sector, have been impacted. Uh, as well as just struggles to maintain livelihoods in other sectors. So when you think about, you know, um, issues like um, market vendors in, in the Pacific, 75 to 90 percent of market vendors in the Pacific are in fact women. So trying to ensure that there were mechanisms to keep markets open, to keep markets safe and COVID free, that they have been real issues um, during this period. On the health front, um, you, you know, we've seen sort of a, the diversion of scarce health resources being diverted from things like sexual and reproductive health to try and deal with, you know, health impacts of COVID-19 in, in particular. Um, and that's been another area of concern, obviously, to, to many um, women's organisations in the Pacific. And of course, what we've heard in other regions of the world, but it absolutely applies in the Pacific context as well, where we've seen pressures on women as primary caregivers and increases in unpaid care work have absolutely applied um, in the Pacific as well. At the same time as we've seen all of these pressures on, on women in the Pacific, we know how crucial and critical women's roles have been in the response in the Pacific when a number of international workers obviously um, had started to pull out or, or international organizations had started to pull out their workers um, at the start of COVID-19, we saw women's organizations in the region really stepping up to play an important role in supporting communities across the Pacific on issues like gender-based violence and on the health issues in particular. I, I also am really encouraged to see that we have seen some in, uh, governments in the region take the opportunity of a crisis, which this is, to push for transformative changes. And I think one of the best examples of this that I have seen is the Fijian government's efforts to undertake public consultations during the midst of a crisis, during uh, COVID-19, on developing a new um, action national action plan on the prevention of violence against women and girls so i think as i said they're really to be commended on that work you know trying to bring about transformative change knowing that you know what they have seen is spikes in gender-based violence at this time but using the crisis as an opportunity to to bring that change about 
Um, and I think that's, you know, one area where, um, you know, Australia is, is certainly looking at, you know, how we can support and add force to, to those efforts. Many of the WPS issues that have arisen throughout the Pacific, of course, are rooted in existing gender inequalities, obviously, which affects kind of access to resources, basic rights and needs, women's representation and voice. And we've been a long uh, supporter and advocate for gender equality and women's empowerment in the Pacific. I mean, that goes back to, we've had very large programs as you would be familiar with Ambassador Vivia, um, including Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development, which you know was around since around um, 2012. But it's evident since COVID that we really need to look at whether this was addressing the emerging needs, I think, of, of women as a result of the crisis. In order to get that sense, um, and we haven't, as we talked about before, we haven't been able to travel uh, as much as we would like to the region, um, the Minister for, for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, um, the Honourable Senator Maurice Payne, she hosted three uh, virtual meetings with Pacific Women Leaders last year, one in May, one in August and one in December. And we were really privileged to have over 30 uh, women leaders from 18 different countries across the region participate in those discussions. And they really were, I suppose, a, an opportunity to discuss the issues relevant to the Pacific in the COVID-19 context and how we could address inequalities um, in our response and recovery plans uh, to COVID-19 moving forward. And we've seen some tangible things come out of these meetings, I think. Um, one of them was that now Pacific Island Forum leaders have agreed that there will be a new Pacific Island uh, Forum leaders, uh, women leaders meeting, which will happen ahead of PIF leaders uh, annually. This was a proposal um, by the Minister, um, Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, and the first of these meetings is expected uh, later this year. It's um, Pleasing to say as well that uh, during the recent um, Pacific Triennial uh, Women's uh, Ministerial Meeting, Australia launched a new regional investment called Pacific Women Lead um, to advance gender equality in the Pacific. This is a new program that's uh, uh, worth close to $170 million um, over the next five years, so from 2021 to 2026. Um, it will enable, of course, Australia and the Pacific to work together in partnership to strengthen uh, regional efforts on, on gender equality. Um, as I said, I think we're hoping that the Pacific Women League will use sort of a transformative approach to gender equality with a particular focus on women's leadership, women's rights, and in that context, really focusing on some of those issues that have arisen during COVID, so women's health, including sexual reproductive health and rights issues, women's safety and women's economic empowerment. Um, Pacific Women Lead, I think, also will prioritise the, the voices of the Pacific and ensure that we really have more ownership. I think this whole issue of um, the importance of working with uh, women's rights organisations and civil society organisations during COVID-19, I think, are reflected in the way that this new program is sort of coming about as well. So, um, you know, it, it will really uh, include both regional organisations such as um, the South Pacific SPC community and also um, women CSOs, civil society organisations in the region. The idea is the establishment of a new governance board led by eminent Pacific women leaders and comprised of at least two thirds Pacific women as part of how decisions will be made um, under this new program. So really embedding those ideas of women leading to find solutions for women and girls as well. Um, I mean, we, we're really hoping that we, know, I mean, we obviously know that this is a key part of, you know, how we can respond more effectively to um, COVID-19 in, in the region. While we've been focused on what's been happening in the Pacific, we've also needed to maintain, of course, a focus on what's happening here at home in Australia. Um, and in that regard, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, the Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women has recently released with her colleagues, the Minister of Defence and Home Affairs, our second national action plan 
on women, peace and security. So of course our first national action plan we did back in 2012, our second one was launched in April. So just a, a month ago, um, and this national action plan uh, will span for 10 years. So it's from 2021 to 2031. Um, it will be a whole of government uh, implementation involving obviously other agencies, inc but including the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade from where I'm speaking to you from today. The four key outcomes that we're hoping for are supporting women's meaningful participation and needs in peace processes, reducing sexual and gender based violence, supporting resilience, uh, crisis security, law and justice efforts for women and girls, and demonstrating leadership and accountability for this agenda. Now, plans are great, um, but we are really now, I think, turning our attention to how we can deliver on, on this particular agenda. And I think what we've learned throughout the COVID-19 uh, crisis is that governments cannot do this alone. Um, so, you know, I'm really hoping that we will have the opportunity to engage key civil society organisations pretty soon um, on how we intend to work with them to try and roll out our new National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, which obviously has implications for the region and the Pacific as well. So I hope you, that gives you some sense of uh, what we're doing uh, in the region. And, um, you know, clearly there's still a lot of ground to cover um, and certainly uh, tools like the WPS index and their findings are really helpful and informative in terms of, you know, giving us a steer and direction on, on where we should be um, focusing uh, our efforts. So uh, thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. And I really look forward to hearing the insights from our panelists today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Guevara. And uh, I thought your overview is extremely helpful for now setting uh, the context for this discussion, highlighting uh, not just the issues, uh, but also initiatives that are attempting to get at those issues uh, in terms of, of responses to uh, enabling some of those challenges to be overcome. So thank you for spotlighting the Pacific Islands, for also mentioning uh, what you're doing in Australia. And, um, and thank you too for what you do every day in your role. It's critically important. We're gonna turn now to um, my colleague, Dr. Jenny Klugman, who is the Managing Director of the Georgetown Institute. Uh, she's widely recognized for her work on gender equality, on poverty, uh, human development issues, and so much more. She developed and authored the index about which we're going to be speaking. And just in case there's a question about her accent, she coincidentally is an Australian. Uh, Jenny will provide uh, us with some of the key findings and insights uh, from the index on women, peace, and security and the Pacific Islands. So Jenny, take it away so we can really understand uh, what the index does and how it um, can implicate our work. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Vivir and uh, uh, Guevara. And it, it's so great to be joining you here today. My role is to hopefully um, excite you about the ways in which a tool like the index uh, can help to capture, flag, um, and consolidate many of the things um, that we already know about the challenges um, that face women, the women, peace and security agenda around the world. Um, but doing that in a, in a systematic way um, with the advantages and disadvantages which come with quantitative data, um, but also um, kind of flagging as well um, what's missing um, and what we need to do in the period ahead. So let me um, uh, start by giving uh, you just a sense of, of what's included in the index uh, before going on to some of the kind of broad global findings and then um, focusing much more on the Pacific. Um, as Ambassador Vivir mentioned, um, this index is distinguished by its comprehensiveness. So it goes beyond the aspects of economic and political inclusion that we see in the World Economic Forum and UN indices um, 
we do include education, employment, cell phone, parliamentary representation, of course, because those are very important aspects of um, women's status, um, rights and well-being. But we complement that um, with equal weight to the justice dimensions, uh, both in terms of um, attitudes um, towards gender equality um, and women's work, as well as legal barriers. And I'll go into um, a bit more about how those are actually defined um, further in the presentation. And then very importantly as well, and this is a unique feature of this index, uh, capturing important aspects of uh, women's security. Um, uh, most importantly at the household level, um, as reflected in rates of uh, the prevalence of intimate partner violence, but also their sense of safety in their community, whether they feel safe in their neighborhood at night, um, and then larger levels of violence um, in the society at large. So as um, has already been mentioned, we uh, managed to do this in 2019 uh, together with the Peace Research Institute of Oslo for um, 167 countries around the world um, had at least eight of the 11 indicators that we need in order to be able to estimate this index. Uh, here are the overall global rankings. I won't dwell on this um, too much. Um, I guess you will notice that there are no uh, countries in the region either at the top or right at the bottom, um, but um, uh, you'll see um, shortly where um, kind of various countries in, in, um, in the Pacific region sit. Um, clearly a number of the countries uh, which are among the worst performers as uh, Ambassador Veer already mentioned are um, countries which are devastated by kind of chronic ongoing conflicts um, and often very severe conflicts in the recent past. Um, but interestingly, when we take out the specific measure of conflict from uh, the estimates, these countries still do really badly. Um, so these conflicts are having devastating impacts across the board um, beyond um, the tragedy of the deaths being incurred. And of course, as already mentioned, um, the update for 20. 21 is is forthcoming. An important role of this index is, of course, to raise awareness uh, to the important agendas that Ambassador Guevara was um, speaking to, uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, um, which was adopted by the Security Council in 2000, important commitments that have been made around the Sustainable Development Agenda, um, and all of the indicators that we use can be linked directly to the Sustainable Development Goals. So we're happy that it's been picked up um, in kind of the, the, the broader media, um, including National Geographic and uh, a number of other publications noted here, as well as in um, august academic publications, such as those uh, edited by uh, Professor True, um, whom you'll be uh, hearing from uh, shortly. Um, so here are the rankings uh, for, for the region, uh, which is our focus um, today. Um, and you'll see, um, you know, it, I've, I've included here uh, New Zealand and Australia um, for comparison, and it's somewhat notable that Australia does somewhat significantly worse than uh, New Zealand, but we won't dwell on that today. Um, uh, the Solomons, we, I think an important point to make is that we're not able to include all of the countries in the Pacific, unfortunately, in the index, because simply because the data is not available. Um, we do have data for, for the three countries that I've included here. Uh, Papua New Guinea um, is uh, towards the bottom, uh, and Solomon Islands also does fairly badly, as you'll see, uh, for reasons um, that I'll go into, um, into shortly. And let me just focus on the aspects which have already been touched on, but just put some, if you like, harder numbers here uh, in terms of intimate partner violence. Um, the rates uh, for East Asia and the Pacific where kind of more broadly um, uh, these countries sit um, have an overall prevalence of intimate partner violence. We use current violence, which is in the past 12 months of one in five. But in Papua New Guinea, it's over 30%, which is indeed the fifth worst uh, rate in the world. And even Palau, which is um, does relatively better uh, um, in the Pacific, still does worse than the global average, um, which uh, for current violence um, is about 12.5%. Um, looking more specifically, um, the information that we have, and this is from the most recent WHO numbers, uh, and this is pre-pandemic, um, so it doesn't necessarily count 
or reflect um, the the worsening that we've expected um, over the past year with economic stress and, and lockdowns and so on. But you'll see here that um, uh, very high rates in particular in Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomons and Vanuatu, <coughs> and indeed they're among the eight worst uh, countries um, in all of the world uh, in terms of intimate partner violence. Um, another major challenge which has already been alluded to is uh, political participation. We measure that in the index um, um, using rates of uh, representation in, in national parliaments. Um, and sadly, all the countries in the Pacific uh, are below the world average, uh, which is now around 22, 23%. Um, Fiji is the only country um, which approaches the regional average. And very depressingly, um, there are three countries in the world which have no women in parliament at present, uh, Micronesia, Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu, and they're all in the uh, Pacific. Um, that doesn't mean that there have never been any women in parliament in those countries, but there are currently none at all. So I'm really looking forward to listening to, to Helen and others um, on this um, um, on this, and this just shows basically the same data again relative to, to the world average and um, uh, the re regional averages. Um, I mean, my sense here, and it's a much larger conversation, but it does seem that um, kind of much more deliberate uh, efforts like quotas would have an important role to play in kind of boosting these extremely low levels um, because we have seen globally that those can work at least to help kickstart um, as well as I think the very important role that political parties play um, as gatekeepers um, in terms of determining who's able to, to run for office, um, especially in, in winnable seats. Um, on the legal discrimination, um, here we use the measure which is actually estimated by uh, the World Bank in their Women, Business and the Law um, uh, exercise uh, which does a great job measuring across the eight domains which I've mentioned here. I won't go into the details but it is worth flagging that here again uh, the Pacific Islands are doing very badly. So this is a direct reflection of the national legislation which was on the books which has formal discrimination against women um, whether it be in the workplace, in marriage, with respect to parenthood um, and so on. So the, there's very direct actions that can be taken um, to address those doesn't necessarily mean that the norms will change, um, but certainly the laws uh, can be improved um, in, in a number of countries in the region. Um, and how these add up, of course, is important as well. And here I'm just using the example of Papua New Guinea, um, which you saw scored the lowest among the countries for which we had data um, in the region um, and highlighting here again, the, the, the fronts on which um, Papua New Guinea does um, does relatively badly. Um, I'm obviously moving through fairly quickly, happily to come back in questions. And I would of course encourage you to um, uh, to take a look at the report. The, the link was, was dropped in the chat earlier on. Um, I do wanna underline that all the figures I've presented so far are pre-pandemic. Um, we're in the midst now of trying to work out how to reflect some of the adverse um, uh, trends um, uh, in the in the 2021 update, but as already been mentioned, um, uh, significant impacts on uh, informal sector work, including market vendors. Um, women are four out of five nurses in the region. Um, widespread job losses, particularly among women, um, and of course, uh, what the UN Secretary General had termed the shadow pandemic um, of in terms of the the worsening rates of intimate partner violence. And here um, uh, in Fiji, at least it's been recognized, um, uh, very high reporting um, rates to, to hotlines um, associated with, with the lockdown um, last year. So let me just kind of speak briefly about um, missing data. I've already alluded to this. So we had enough um, information to estimate overall index scores uh, for just three of the Pacific Islands. Um, we do have good coverage on the parliamentary representation, on legal discrimination, and pretty good coverage actually now on intimate partner violence. Um, but we are lacking data on um, important aspects of inclusion, um, on community safety, um, even on education, um, among other aspects. 
Um, clearly, there are challenges uh, which are which are well recognised. I know a lot of effort has um, been um, devoted to addressing some of these gaps. Um, it's promising that the World Bank now has a major initiative, um, very recent, of course, uh, to invest in data collection and modernisation. Um, and UN Women as well um, has um, uh, proposed working with um, regional agencies, a Pacific. Uh, roadmap to improve data over the next uh, decade. Clearly, it, it's a longer term agenda. Um, so finally here, um, just to uh, remind or advertise that we will be having um, a, a, a new um, update published towards the end of the year. We very much encourage you to uh, check out the website and see, um, uh, you know, uh, explore the resources and tools um, that we have here and uh, very much welcome your your feedback as well as your your questions thanks very much thanks jenny for walking us through all of that i think there are a lot of issues now that we can hear uh, how they're being dealt with or uh, perhaps uh, additional information on them from our distinguished panel uh, we're going to turn for first uh, to Dr. Fiona Hukula, who's the Gender Specialist for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, where she works closely with civil society networks around the Pacific region to build capacity and improve policies relating to gender equality. Most recently, she served as the Senior Research Fellow and Building Safer Communities Program Leader uh, at the Papua New Guinea National Research Institute. She's also held a number of uh, other positions focused on addressing um, violence against women, uh, as well as other issues. Um, Fiona, it's so good to have you with us. Uh, we're very interested in getting your perspective, uh, particularly on Papua New Guinea. Uh, you have a lot of ex experience firsthand um, on the issues that Jenny talked about uh, that are part of the index. Uh, and specifically, it will be uh, useful to hear how you're dealing with the deep-seated uh, pervasive problem of uh, gender-based violence. Um, so much of it at its root are attitudes, mindsets, norms. Um, how do you get at those uh, and really what's working, what's been successful, where are you seeing uh, progress and what kind of um, support could you use in your work? Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you very much for the invitation to participate um, on this uh, webinar today. So as you mentioned, I'm five weeks new into um, my new role at the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. Um, but I, I have left um, a role which I've played for over 20 years as a researcher in the, uh, for the PNG National Research Institute, mainly addressing the issues around um, gender-based violence. And, and I'd like to speak today to some of the issues that Jenny mentioned, uh, that came up in the uh, Jenny's presentation. Um, but I think firstly, in terms of context uh, for PNG, like everywhere else in the Pacific, I think there are several factors that drive high rates of violence against women and girls. Um, the majority of Papua New Guineans like elsewhere in the Pacific live in rural areas have high, uh, have a subsistence livelihood um, and often lack access to basic services such as health and education um, and opportunities for income generation. These constraints provide the push factors for people to move to urban settings where formal employment is limited, um, housing is limited, and again, access to services is a challenge. Um, and so these are the kinds of um, and, and let me just add also that I think importantly, 
our strong customary and social practices, including um, uh, the, the role that um, interpretations of religious beliefs, Christianity, play in our society every day, guide the kinds of relations we have in terms of men and women, gender relations. Um, and these all impact um, and take different forms of violence against women and girls, um, but most prominently uh, intimate partner violence or domestic violence. Um, also a deeply ingrained cultural violence um, and challenges with holding perpetrators to account in both the formal and informal system have, um, has provided that in, enabling environment for, for violence to, to thrive in Papua New Guinea. And I'd like to come back to, to what Jenny's slide and speak to this issue around access to justice, because I think that's one of the key things. In, in a lot of times we say that we need to strengthen the laws, but I think in Papua New Guinea we have the laws are already there. We've got a good set of laws. Our constitution is very clear about gender um, equality and equal participation for all. Our challenges around are around things like policing. So I've had um, I've spent the last four years working on sorcery accusation related violence, which has a, a specific gen gendered. Um, there's a gendered nature to to sorcery accusation related violence um, in some parts of Papua New Guinea. And the challenges around policing is very, um, is really quite large in terms of geographic challenges. So um, the ability for police to get to places where women are being um, tortured and also resource constraints. Often police don't have the very basics um, to get out to um, places to assist women. So that's around the challenges of the formal justice system. And when there is cases where women are able to get help and police are able to get to um, some of these rural and remote areas, this is the issue of having witnesses come forward and, and for the case to pursue right through the criminal justice system. But we also have a very large informal justice system um, through mediation, what we call committee, our, our village court system, which is really key to address, in my view, to addressing violence against women in PNG, because um, these are the systems that are there for the majority. So um, those are the kinds of issues that are, um, I think help or are not helping in, in addressing this issue. And I think also um, the growing inequality within PNG society is contributing to a generation of dis disenfranchised men um, who are desperately trying to find their place in a society with the role of men and or the man as the provider and protector is increasingly being challenged. Um, and, and the ways in which we can address this is various things. We've seen some really good work um, in PNG from our local um, civil society organizers, organizations from really com grassroots community-based organizations such as um, Jiwaka's Voice for Change, from our Highlands Human Rights Defenders, um, from women's rights activists. So I think this is where, where we can support at all different levels. So um, to be able to help those people who are right there on the ground. Um, uh, one of the things I believe is the challenge for us is the big disconnect between Port Moresby and the laws and, and all the legislation and all the policy that happens at the national level and the disconnect to the provincial and also to the very local level. And so here we have um, seen good examples of communities taking ownership of their issues and trying to address it um, through various means. So I, I gave the example of the work of the human rights defenders in the Highlands. Um, Cook Women for Peace is another really good organization. But um, I am also aware of communities, meaning you know community leaders that are mainly men um, who acknowledge that they have issues to do various issues, social issues, which also include um, 
violence against women in all its forms. So the intimate partner, domestic violence, social accusation related violence. Um, so communities taking the initiative to address their issues through things like um, community bylaws. So it's basically them policing themselves because th the challenges, as I mentioned, are, are the challenges that happen at the national level. They come down to the provincial level and then our people at the very and mainly women are um, at the sort of receiving end of all of that. And I think probably before I stop, I'd like to also speak a little bit to the issue of um, us ha not having, Papua New Guinea not having women in our parliament. I think there's, the connection is there in that the leadership space at the very highest level isn't uh, we don't have women there. I, we've got limited numbers of women in our public service and the public service at the leadership level in the public service. And it's the public service machinery that will move a lot of that the bureaucracy is going to move um, the policies um, and the agenda of, um, of the government of the day. So my view is that we need to have women in all sectors of, of Papua New Guinea at, at the national level, parliament, um, at the provincial level, at the local level. And, and we do have reserve seats in, at, at uh, Motukoite level. In our provincial um, assemblies, there's seats for women. And also in Bougainville, we've got reserve seats for women. So there's, there's always a really big debate around that in this country, but um, we don't recognize that we've already got systems that we can look to and also um, examples, sorry, examples that we can look to and also within our region um, where we've seen what's, uh, especially in Samoa. Um, and so it's, it's good for, in my view, for us to look at what we have already and also what's, what's out there in the region. Um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions coming from our audience. Uh, so we'll pick up again with you. But uh, uh, thank you, particularly on, on the practices, uh, mentioning what seems to be working and beginning to chip at uh, some of those challenges. We're going to turn now to Dr. Jackie True, who's a uh, professor of international relations and director of Monash's University Center for Global Peace and Security. Um, and we at Georgetown are pleased to participate with Monash in a consortium of centers, small number that they are, uh, on women, peace and security. She is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, a global fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo as well, and widely published on issues of gender mainstreaming, gender governance, violence against women, women, peace and security, um, and women's roles in extremism, violent extremism, extremism as well. And she's held academic positions at a number of universities. Uh, so Jackie, welcome. It's, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, as well. Uh, you're an expert on so many issues, particularly uh, on women, peace and security. And I wonder what your views are on exclusion, injustice and insecurity in the Pacific. Um, particularly as, as we know, those are key barriers uh, to women's well-being. Uh, and again, to pick up on what's working, uh, what contributions are making a difference, um, and just bringing your experience to bear on this discussion. Thank you very much, Am Ambassador Vivir, and, and thank you uh, to Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for the opportunity to speak uh, about the relevance of the Women, Peace and Security Index uh, in the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Island countries in particular. Um, I think the, the three elements of the index, justice, inclusion and security, are really key in, in enabling us to see how women's status in one area affects their status in another. So just to second what Fiona has been saying about uh, the, the underlying political economy uh, that shapes violence against women and men's perpetration of, of violence, 
I, I think is, is really clear from the index. Um, we can see that, for example, when women don't have good access to resources, to livelihoods and income, as well as to public space uh, and representation, they're much more likely uh, to be in precarious situations where they experience abuse at home um, and at work and in the public realm. Uh, and there's more likely to be impunity um, or poor access to justice, as Fiona mentioned. But I think the other side of it, which is perhaps not covered by the index, is that um, you know, there, there are conditions, stru structural conditions, which uh, Fiona mentioned, the, the urbanization, the, the rising socioeconomic inequality, um, which affect men. Uh, and loss of employment and status for men, uh, which coupled with gender norms also lead men to, to react violently uh, and to take out uh, those uh, frustrations uh, and stresses on, on women. And I think we, we can definitely see that um, contributing to the escalation of uh, violence against women uh, in the Pacific. So in the Pacific, I mean, obviously the, the relatively poor rankings across all the three dimensions of the index help to explain why uh, violence against women is so widespread and, and definitely at epidemic levels well before COVID, um, as Am Ambassador Guevara already explained. So maybe just a few points. Um, I think that when we look at the, the security dimension of the index, um, uh, it points to a major protection gap in the Pacific. Um, and Fiona mentioned this already when she talked about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the poor access to justice, the, the challenges um, with regard to policing in remote and rural areas, um, and the need to really improve community responses and community leadership on, on violence against women. Um, I think that, uh, you know, she also referred to other types of violence against women, which are not yet covered by the index because there is no data on them or, or, or little data at least. And I think that's something to think about, you know, the persistent rates of early in child marriage in, in the Pacific. Um, I think in the last 20 years, there's only been a decrease by 10% um, of early in child marriage. And of course, you know, um, intimate partner violence is much more likely if you've, if you've married um, under 18 years. Uh, and then of course, also the sorcery, the gender related sorcery and witchcraft killings, which also indicate the, the presence of discriminatory gender norms. So I think, you know, I think that the protection gaps are significant, well, you know, well be also beyond intimate partner violence, looking at the range of forms um, of violence against women in the region. And then with regard to the inclusion dimension, Fiona started to pick up on this as well and talking about women's um, community leadership, uh, civil society leadership. So that in the index, um, I think that definitely the political participation um, and representation in parliaments are crucial indicators for contributing to gender equality. Um, and, and that is an important dimension of women, peace and security uh, and the agenda, um, which really focuses on women's participation in peace and security, decision making. But women's inclusion and agency uh, is not only a measure of their representation in parliament. So I think one thing that we need to really look for, and I think this is where the, uh, the, the hopeful um, uh, you know, practices uh, can be found uh, is, is needing to be able to recognize and highlight women's agency in leading and mobilizing civil society movements for change. And those include um, movements uh, to improve state responses to violence against women and certainly to call out, uh, you know, violence against women as, as a crime um, and to call for respect for women. So these are really important movements and they are, have been growing uh, across the Pacific. I mean, we've seen really major protests in Papua New Guinea uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and these are really important forms of leadership. Um, and Fiona also talked about men's community leadership and calling out this violence as well. I am sure that Sharon uh, Bhagwan Rolls is going to speak about the importance of women's leading um, climate justice and preparedness movements. So we've got to be able to recognize uh, this leadership, which falls outside of the formal realm. 
Um, and I think, but, but I think that that is where the hopeful leadership is coming from. And we need to be able to create pathways from the civil society leadership into the formal realm, into the formal political leadership. Um, and we, there are some bright spots in the region. I mean, we have seen um, women peace builders in Bougainville kind of, you know, uh, also become political representatives uh, in the new parliament there. Um, and um, and obviously there are some bright spots in, in the Western Pacific, in Samoa, with the new uh, prime minister being a woman. Um, but it's about joining up, you know, women's community networks with um, women representatives and using those community networks as, as uh, you know, pathways for promoting broader leadership. Um, and I think in the Pacific, there is this concept which is very prevalent in the climate justice movements called Talanoa. And that really uh, is important from, from a gender perspective because it, it pays attention to uh, women's, if, to everyday experience, to knowledge that comes from everyday experience. And I think that is a route to bring in uh, women's leadership and, and knowledge. And finally, maybe with regard to the justice dimension, again, I mean, uh, Jenny Klugman has really um, shown like, you know, the, you know, still the high degree of uh, discrimination in law in the Pacific um, uh, in the index. Um, but of course, you know, it's, um, you know, issues of access to justice as Fiona mentioned, but discrimination in practice. Um, even when states have really good laws, which, you know, many of the Pacific Island states do have good laws, um, but these laws are not adequately implemented. And we've seen this uh, during the COVID crisis. So, for example, access to uh, sexual and uh, reproductive health um, is being really compromised. Uh, and uh, we found in a survey last year that, you know, access was 41% decreased. Um, during COVID. If we think about the, the domestic violence law, for example, in Papua New Guinea, um, which has a requirement to provide shelter to victims and survivors of domestic violence, um, yet many of the shelters were closed um, during COVID restrictions, uh, or were not able to take uh, victims and survivors. So this is not like an adequate implementation of the law. And then um, in the survey we ran last year in July, August, we had some horrendous examples um, of uh, teenage girls' safety in the Solomon Islands, um, you know, teenage pregnancies and really no um, support and protection there and stories about um, babies being dumped in, in dustbins, um, you know, with, you know, rather than, um, you know, being able to access services to support uh, those pregnancies. So I think that um, this is where the, the, the rise of women's civil society leadership, women's women led movements and public campaigns to raise awareness about um, women's rights, sexual and reproductive rights and about gender based violence is so important. And as Ambassador Guevara pointed to, the pandemic crisis is an opportunity to address gender based violence, given it's seen as a widely universal problem globally. Um, and um, I think there's therefore less stigma for governments to really step up, um, but also, you know, more, perhaps more, more urgency. Um, and maybe just to, to sort of, I, I think that the, the Women, Peace and Security Index is, is really um, a, a key tool for uh, really revealing those macro patterns um, and also to sort of further push our research, our participatory research into the causes and contexts of gender inequality uh, and insecurity and the, and, the, and the local responses to them. So, I mean, I think the idea that the US, the what WPS index for the US states is a real innovation because it looks at the subnational level. And I think it would be great to have many more indexes which started to look at this subnational level um, I think which, uh, you know, Fiona also referred to in the Pacific. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the things, one of the, the interesting analysis Georgetown did last year, I think also shows the, the you know, the, um, the importance of, of, of the, the data when we can see the, the connection between the degree of, um, uh, you know, women's inclusion, security and access 
um, the epidemic risk. Um, uh, so we find that not only countries that have, for example, women leaders may, may have had more effective responses to the pandemic, but in fact, countries where women's inclusion, security and access to justice is better, they're much more likely to have the state and societal capacity to respond to um, you know, a pandemic crisis. Um, which, so I think it really points to, you know, that it, it, women, peace and security is not just a, a good thing for women's empowerment, but it's actually crucial for bringing greater security to everyone um, and certainly to the region. So I think the index can really help uh, uh, with advocacy um, and, and civil society advocacy in particular around women, peace and security national action plans in the Pacific. Um, and I think uh, it could be used also to push for um, a, a second regional action plan. Uh, and what a regional action plan in the Pacific could do is actually set region-wide targets um, to eliminate sexual and gender-based violence, among other things. But this would be, you know, this could be really mobilizing um, for governments and that could actually enable them to share uh, good practices um, and to kind of really monitor and, uh, you know, uh, uh, ensure that they're actually making progress and reducing violence and not just um, passing laws with the intent to reduce violence. Uh, and finally, I think the index is, it could, you know, is, is really uh, an important guide for donors. Um, and maybe something to consider in the future and a future index is to think about actually measuring the investments in gender equality and in women, peace and security um, to help drive donor and government commitments and hold them accountable. And, uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's great to see Australia uh, and also New Zealand supporting um, women, peace and security. Uh, in the Pacific and supporting Pacific governments and women's civil society organizations. Um, and it would be great to be able to, you kind of, you know, kind of show those commitments uh, and monitor those uh, and continue to hold all governments uh, accountable for uh, increasing women's inclusion uh, and uh, really responding to, to women's insecurity. Um, uh, in the future. And that, that would be a major point of difference, um, you know, between countries like Australia and New Zealand and their support for this area. And for example, countries like China, which barely invest anything uh, in, in the promotion of women, peace and security. Well, thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you for making um, those very strong connections between the various dimensions of the index. What's lacking in one area certainly can pose terrible problems in another. Uh, for the spotlighting of uh, women's movements and what a difference they make uh, in many ways and certainly in terms of implementation. Uh, and let's hope that your call to action can be heeded uh, in terms of uh, refinements of uh, indices and uh, areas that they can focus on um, more significantly. I know you have to leave uh, because you had another commitment, uh, but we're delighted you could be with us uh, and for keeping this perspective uh, so strong on these issues. So thanks. We're gonna turn now to um, Sharon Bhagwan Rolls, who uh, Jackie mentioned. She is a women's rights advocate in Fiji and chair and gender liaison on the uh, board of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. Uh, she works at the intersection of gender, communications, and peace, serving as a technical, technical advisor for shifting the power coalition, uh, which is based on the Pacific Islands, and is co-chair of the Global Fund for Women's Board um, and holds many positions and affiliations. Uh, with long time engagement on women, peace and security. So Sharon, thank you to you too for being with us today. Um, hopefully you can touch on uh, some of those aspects of the index as they relate to Fiji and your experience. And I hope you will indeed talk a little bit about uh, climate justice, actions on climate, because it is such a a, a major daily concern, a growing concern uh, in the Pacific Islands. Um, and, and 
and ways perhaps that we can bring greater accountability on the part of governments to these issues. So it's all yours, Sharon. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And it's just wonderful to join you all today from Suva here in the Pacific Islands. Um, as you've rightly said, the WPS index does indeed unveil an important reality beyond the picture postcard view of my Pacific Island region, where in the lifetime of one generation, low-lying islands have indeed disappeared or become uninhabitable across the region. We also have the increasing intensity and frequency of natural disasters, which result in considerable loss to people and our cultures. COVID-19 is also a stark reminder of how women and girls remain vulnerable and marginalized without targeted accountability to women's rights and feminist practice in response and recovery plans. And it's not surprising that the WPS index identifies the underrepresentation of women in Pacific parliaments in addition to high rates of violence. So we've already talked about the suite of regional and national policy commitments, but I want to just you know, quickly refer to the Beijing Platform for Action 1325, the first regional action plan on WPS and the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration. These are important commitments, but commitments also require implementation. The implementation needs to be transformative with key indicators and dedicated resources. So even though there have been reports of high rates of violence um, as a result of the COVID lockdowns, if you review the, um, the funding allocation, there was no specific uh, allocation to protection or GBV response in the regional COVID response. And that's where, as Jackie says, the feminist movement in the Pacific is, is making change. We've contributed to the development of the global policy, and we've also ensured that there's reference in UNSCR 2242 to climate. Now, we also need to look beyond the parliamentary systems of representation and bring forward the work of the local peacebuilding community again, and particularly women in communities to accelerate the joint action to realize the transformative change we all want to see for inclusion in decision-making through traditional and faith institutions, as well as local and sub-national governance structures. And we've seen our women's rights and feminist movements step in every time there's been a crisis, communicating lived experiences and recommendations on how our leaders can use a peace development and humanitarian approach in the localization of the Bow Declaration. And as such, I'm really proud to say that women are really leading in this triple nexus approach. We don't act alone and we engage in coalitions. And supporting coalition building is really a way of supporting smaller local organizations to influence these political spaces by strengthening our collective power. And that's why in 2016, GPAC Pacific supported the establishment of the Shifting the Power Coalition to redefine the table. And we bring together through this coalition a network of close to 100,000 um, grassroots intergenerational and inclusive movements from seven Pacific Island Forum countries. This kind of coalition building is critical to respond to crises, including climate change. We're building and systematizing a feminist and inclusive model of participation and um, collaboration, not simply replicating patriarchal systems of practice, which we have to be very cautious about when we talk about women's political participation. We can't just replicate the status quo because that hasn't worked for us. But we need to address the gaps in women's access to power and decision-making, promoting our leadership um, to have a say on water, food, infrastructure, those very barriers that are, are, um, are challenging us. So it's time to redesign the process to reaffirm what the Pacific Women's Movement offers, our networks, our agencies, our abilities and innovations, and also at the same time, not homogenizing women into just one group, but being prepared to work through the different tracks of coalitions. So one example um, I would like to raise in terms of transformation is really looking at the budgetary support for national gender offices, which currently remain very under-resourced. 
we also need to really reevaluate the um, the percentage of funds dedicated to women in humanitarian action as well, particularly at the local and national level, and also recognize that only 99% of current aid actually is reaching um, or is not reaching um, women and feminist organizations directly. So the role of feminist funds and feminist coalitions is critical. So while we you know, really welcome the, the bilateral funding, I think it's also important that funding doesn't make us try to scrab, scramble to fit into different silos, but looks at the way in which the collective work of local women can be supported. And this requires localization and flexibility. Um, it also means that we've got to shift the power and start to look at how do we also ensure that they're sustaining resources to work with young women, to work with our children, grandchildren, with women with disabilities. So as I've mentioned already, we see the way forward and uh, Jackie alluded to a new regional action plan. I probably personally need to be a little bit more convinced because I never saw the resourcing of our first regional action plan. And I think now that we have the Bode Declaration, we need to really forge ahead in, in the context of the Pacific to look at the peace development and humanitarian nexus approach. Now this requires um, a strong foundation and, and the willingness of our government, the Pacific Islands Forum, and, and with the support of the UN system to help us engage in these processes. So we've got a couple of very quick recommendations to move this approach. One is um, to make sure that there's a shift away from political strategies that perpetuate military responses and the securitization of the climate crisis. We need to see better understanding, collective understanding of the human security agenda to ensure it's inclusive and people centered. Um, and this requires the, 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 the use of multi stakeholder approaches, local leadership, and as I alluded to, flexible funding. And it's one of the regions why, reasons why GPAC has joined the Generation Equality Forums, WPS, and Humanitarian Action Compact because this is a real way of driving this localization agenda with a five-year plan. Um, second, um, when we talk about the impact of policy, we shouldn't just look at um, high-level impact, but really look at the community impact and listen to the stories and voices of women at the time when there are crisis situations, but also to learn from that to get better at prevention and preparedness. Um, the third is um, a greater inclusion um, of the triple nexus, um, integrating greater inclusion in the triple nexus approach also needs to shift from individual political will. We need to see a proper system-wide institutionalization of accountability. So we have you know, the women's rights commitments, we have the WPS agenda, we welcome Australia's new national action plan on WPS, but we need to be able to see that political will from uh, officials, from ministries of foreign affairs, working with the Pacific Island Forum and not just saying, oh, this is gender equality or this is about women. So let's just only leave it to the national women's machineries. So we need to get better at this political drive to enhance coordination with a focus on um, locally informed preventive action. And I can't say enough about equitable and flexible funding for each stage, each actor at each level of the response for long-term recovery with a specific focus on the diversity of women and young people through our regional and local coalitions. Um, in conclusion, we don't need new commitments. We have redesigned the table ourselves to drive action. Now across the Pacific, we are weaving our maps to create a space for member states and the United Nations to join us as local experts to develop and institutionalize frameworks that are rooted in local realities and not just global policies. The action we feel that is needed to address the triple nexus, which should be locally driven and globally supported. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I mean, you covered a lot and I, I'm very grateful that you mentioned the whole issue of resources because it's often one of the biggest challenges. We are out of time, but I think we should take at least one question quickly. Uh, 
and see uh, if you and Fiona want to uh, address address it. Allie? So one question here from Rose Perengi in, in, uh, in PNG. She's asking, what are, you, what are your specific recommendations for tackling deep-seated discriminatory gender norms that are often the root cause of issues like violence against women and low representation in government? So who wants to begin? Fiona, do you want to? Fiona, go first. Are you there? Yes. Tackling deep-seated gender norms. Yes. Okay, just quickly. I think, um, cons so um, definitely consistency, um, intergenerational conversations, um, and having those hard conversations at all levels, and, ho and also holding those who are in positions of authority and who are able to make... Um, um, speaking back to what Sharon was saying about, you know, policies and processes that all of those things are also working um, to hold people to account, con continuing um, those <coughs> hard conversations that challenge challenges norms around um, gender. Thank you. Sharon? Um, I made the point of let's not homogenize women. So I think that's really important to recognize that there are many diverse experiences, even within our own Pacific region. And I'd like to quickly flag the role of the media. We need to, you know, not just report on cases of violence or, or crisis situations, but get better at reporting um, and get deeper into addressing those root causes, because unless it gets into the public space, it just remains invisible and that's the way in which we can have conversations in the public space with our faith with our traditional and with our political leaders as well thank you well thank you so much i really regret and apologize to our audience that we are over time at this point i think the discussion has been a rich one i would encourage uh, the audience to check out the websites of our guests uh, and perhaps follow up in some way, uh, as we will also try to summarize uh, this discussion. I want to thank everybody who joined us. Um, this event will continue to live on our website at the Georgetown Institute for anybody who wants to refer to it. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador, for being with us. Uh, and to you, Sharon, to Fiona, uh, to Jackie for joining us. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, and I really want to thank the Australian Embassy uh, here in Washington uh, for uh, co-hosting this event with us. We're very grateful. Uh, and hopefully we can continue to focus on the Pacific Islands um, and uh, the Pacific in general. So thanks to each and every one of you and continue your good work. Bye-bye. <laughs>